Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the 10 series of geosynthetic webinar under the theme Implications of Geotechnical Engineering Principles in Design and Construction of Geosynthetics Reinforced Wall. This event is brought to you by the Indonesian Chapter of International Geosynthetic Society or INA IGS. My name is Rifanur Kayung Yun, and it is, a it is a pleasure to act as your master ceremony in this event. Before we start, Allow me to read the rundown of our event this uh, morning. First, I will be reading the rules of the webinar. Second, there will be opening remarks by the president of INA IGS, Bapak Budianto Wijaya. After that, the event will be guided by Bapak Michael Dobi as our moderator to start the presentation of our speaker, Professor Chung Si Kyu. The event will then continue with a Q&A session. We would like to ask you to stay with us until the end of the event because we will be doing a quiz with a total of 250,000 rupiah for two winners. We will also give you access to the e-certificate at the end of this webinar. Ladies and gentlemen, for your own convenience, please put attention to the following rules. First, you can submit your questions for the speaker through the Q&A feature located at the bottom of your screen. The question should be in English. You can raise your question before, during, and after the presentation of the speaker. We expect you to stay with us until the end of the event to get the information you need regarding the e-certificates and also the soft copy of the presentation from the speaker. This event is also live streamed on INAIGS YouTube channel, or you can directly go to the link bit.ly slash inaigs 10 yt if you have any questions, please contact Sandy at the numbers shown on your screen or on the chat box. Now, without further ado, I would like to invite the president of INA IGS, Bapak Budi Yantowijaya, to give his opening remarks. To Bapak Budi, the time is yours. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, especially for our distinguished speaker, Professor Chung Sik Yu. Professor Chung Sik Yu is the president of the International Geosynthetic Society. We are delighted that he will deliver his presentation today for the INA IGS webinar series. I hope this webinar can bridge the importance of current geosynthetics research and applications. For the monthly 2021 webinar agenda alone, we have invited 12 geosynthetics experts from Indonesia and abroad. This online webinar is for free, and we highly appreciate the enthusiasm from the attendees for the periods of January to September 2021. All the attendances come from 24 countries worldwide with the average number of attendees is 250 participants per webinar. Thus, we are confident that we can offer types of knowledge sharing platforms between academicians and practitioners in the future. Thank you very much for full support from our webinar series committee led by Pak Sandi. My appreciation also goes to all the audiences for today's webinar and you are very welcome to join the membership of INA IGS. Finally, I hope this webinar can be one of your valuable sources. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bapak Budi, for your kind remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, now this webinar will be guided by our moderator, Bapak Michael Dobi. Before I give the floor to Bapak Michael Dobi, I would like to remind you that you can start submitting your questions from now, during and after the presentation by using the Q&A feature. We would also like to remind you to stay with us until the end of the event to get the information you need regarding the e-certificates and also the soft copy of the presentation from the speakers. Now, please welcome our moderator, Bapak Michael Dobi. To Bapak Michael Dobi, the time is yours. Thank you very much, Rifa, for your introduction. Um, I have the great pleasure and honor today of of uh, introducing our speaker. 
and telling you something about him. Um, before I do that, I would also like to thank, as did Pat Budi, our committee that organizes these events. Uh, we're now on the 10th of our webinars this year, and they've all been extremely successful. And that's largely due to the incredible organization that goes on behind the scenes uh, to make these events run so smoothly. So our guest of honor today, Professor Chung Sik Yu. Um, now, I first came across Chung Sik's work uh, in a paper he published in 2004. Uh, and it was about um, the performance of a six-year-old uh, reinforced soil retaining wall, uh, which had some problems. And I'd have to say the information in that case study is extremely useful. And I, I've, I've used it and referred to it many times since then, uh, because it's one of those important things we need to learn about. And uh, maybe we'll hear about it today. I don't know yet. Uh, you'll, you'll probably find out. But and then uh, around about that time, uh, Chung Sik also was the organizer of Geo Asia 2004, which, which I attended, which was a, uh, a very good event. Uh, and then if we come forward um, another 14 years to 2018, then we have the, the 11th International Geosynthetics Conference, which was held in Seoul and You'll be, not be surprised to hear that the chairman of the committee for that event was also Professor Chung Sik Yu. He's, he's a, a very busy gentleman uh, when it comes to these, these sorts of activities, which, which give greatly to, to the community of, of geotechnical engineers and also geosynthetics specialists together. Um, actually, the, the, the event in Seoul was very good. I, again, I was lucky to attend that. Um, and at that event, he was elected as president of the IGS, as you've just heard. In fact, he's the fourth president of the IGS to speak to us this year. So we're very lucky to, that we, we've, we've had some talks from some very eminent people. Now, you might also be interested to hear that one year before that, in 2017, uh, Seoul was also the, the host of the 19th International Conference of Soil Mechanics and geotechnical engineering. And you may also not be too surprised to hear that our, our speaker was also involved in that committee. He wasn't the president this time, but he was certainly heavily involved. So uh, his, his contribution to these, these sorts of events where we all learn so much is, is, is very significant. Um, and during this time, he manages to find time to be the professor of civil and architectural engineering at the Sung Kyun Kwan University in Korea. Um, so uh, we, we are very honored today and, and, and grateful that you can find time to talk to us. The, the topic you've already heard, but I'll just mention it again, implications of geotechnical engineering principles in design and construction of geosynthetic reinforced wall. Now, for me, this is a really important topic because it is bringing together the geosynthetic side of our business together with the geotechnical engineering side. And I'm greatly looking forward to hearing your presentation, Chung Sik, and please take over. The floor is now yours. Uh, thank you, Mike, uh, for your uh, great introduction today. And also thank you, President uh, of NIGS for, for giving me an opportunity to, to give this lecture. And also, uh, this is a wonderful webinar event. And also I congratulate the, the, your team uh, who have made this pos uh, the event possible. Well, uh, actually, uh, as Mike uh, introduced, uh, uh, I and uh, myself and Doug, uh, Mike have met a long time ago. And a couple of years back, I was asked to uh, give a lecture uh, in person. I actually, I, we didn't have any pandemic at the time, but I couldn't make it because of my schedule. Uh, and after that, I promised him uh, to give uh, a lecture in any time, but I'm really glad that uh, I uh, am able to give uh, this lecture today. Okay, before I uh, go further, let me share my screen. Uh, let me do it again. Uh, I have to share uh, my video. Okay, so, okay. Okay, um, 
So as, as introduced, uh, this is my talk, Implication of Geotech Engineering Principles in Design and Construction of Geosynthetic uh, Rainforest Wall. And as a uh, academician, as well as engineer, I always uh, consider the principle very important. But sometimes we forget when you do our work, uh, uh, which uh, makes our uh, job very difficult. So I'm going to touch uh, the simple things, but uh, very important things as well. Okay, so this is my talk today. Uh, since I'm here as, a, as the president of International Geosynthetic Society, I'll give you a brief introduction about the society and also uh, the global warming and sustainability and also uh, geosynthetics. Uh, you will see why I'm bringing that issue today. And I will give uh, lessons learned from the uh, uh, geosynthetic rainforest walls uh, failure uh, due to heavy rainfall that is tied to the global warming and also how to uh, mitigate uh, those problems when you have he heavy rainfall. I'm going to touch briefly uh, based on uh, the research that I'm going, uh, uh, what, uh, what the, the, that I'm going to, uh, where I'm doing. Okay. Okay. Uh, as you know, uh, a geosynthetic society was established in 1983, so we are quite uh, a young society, uh, but uh, we are very active. So we are dedicated to the scientific and engineering development of geosynthetics and associated technology. So our mission uh, is to provide an understanding and promote the appropriate use of geosynthetic technology for sustainable development. Please keep in mind that I uh, the, use the term sus sustainable development. That is very, very important and, and the key word. Now this is the, uh, the structure of uh, IGS leadership, myself, president, and Natalie Tuz, uh, vice president. And uh, Secretary General Eduardo Giannoni and Treasurer Ian Fraser and past President Russell uh, Jones. Uh, actually, we will have a new election next year, so I will, my term will last until next year. So one year left. You are seeing uh, the reason where uh, we have chapters: the dark, uh, uh, the blue colored region. In IGS, uh, which is very active and uh, is located right here. And we, currently, we have 47 chapters with uh, around, around 4,000 uh, individual and student members combined and 197 uh, corporate members. Now, we have a couple of chapters in formation, for example, Nordic chapters and Slovenia and Iceland. Algeria, Guatemala, and Bolivia. So uh, a couple of chapters uh, will be established soon. So we're gonna have more than 50 chapters altogether. Now, this is the IGS membership demographics, as you can see. Uh, Europe, 39%, Asia, 35%. So. Uh, the Asian members are the, uh, the, one of the main uh, drivers of this society. And Pan American 16% and Africa 10%. And also the IGS co prime members and Asia 45% and Europe 34%, 17% from Pan America and also 4% from Africa. So you can see the, there are significant contribution from the Asian region. Now, IGS is uh, uh, being led, governed by the IGS Council. We have uh, altogether uh, 27 uh, council members. Of them, we have 19 elected, five co-opted, and four invited. Now, as I mentioned, the election is coming uh, soon, next year, early next year. So any of you uh, interested in becoming a council and I want to volunteer uh, your time uh, for the IGS. You should stand for uh, the council member. So stand for the elections. Okay, please be, be uh, keep in mind that. Okay. So in terms of the uh, the professions uh, among the twenty seven council members, 
57% from industry and 39% from academia and 4% from government. So, so you can see that we have significant contribution from the industry. So without industry, I just uh, cannot function. So industry is very important in our society and from the region and 28% from Asia, 25% from uh, the uh, Americas, 36% from Europe and 11% from Asia. And this is IJ structures. We have uh, uh, the coordination committee and council committees and task forces and technical committee. Now, some of them are closed and some of them are open. So I would like you to pay attention to uh, technical committees, uh, which is open to anyone, any members uh, of IGS. For example, rain te technical committee on reinforcement and barriers, hydraulics, and stabilization. So within those uh, technical committee activities, we can share the information and you can contribute for industry development. So uh, it, it doesn't take any anything. It is free, and you can you can uh, participate in the uh, technical committee uh, activities. So please visit website. This is uh, the website address. You can join any of the technical committee so so that we can get the information and we can provide information. You can contribute to the IGS activities. Now we will have uh, a new website that is going to be brand new, uh, the state of the art uh, website. Okay, so you're gonna, it's going to have a modern look and functionality and you will find uh, the corporate members uh, address and you can, you can get in touch with those you know, corporate members easily. And we will have, this is very important thing. We will have resource rich digital library. The digital library will contain uh, photos, videos, and journals, and uh, technical uh, and educational documents, and also IGES proceedings. So we call digital libraries is our uh, the signature uh, uh, website, uh, the, the functionality that you can uh, enjoy later on. And to populate the digital library, uh, we have uh, tried to produce the, uh, the so-called IGS University Online Lecture Series videos. As you can see now, four videos are available, uh, including, for example, in the uh, introduction to geosynthetics and geosynthetic products and their manufacturing methods, an overview of geosynthetic properties and testing, and geosynthetic functions. Now, four videos are available uh, in our uh, website as well as YouTube. If you type one of these uh, titles, you can find easily uh, those videos. Now, we, will, we are working on uh, many different uh, lecture series. So probably probably uh, in this next year, maybe three, uh, four or five uh, additional uh, videos you will be uh, made available. Uh, to the members and also to the general public. And also there are many uh, leaflets, uh, leaflets on embankments and uh, just in saying embankments and slopes and walls and so on. And they are two page material that you, from which you can get uh, basic but important information about the just synthetic applications. And also there are uh, translated versions, uh, the leaflets available, Spanish, Chinese, Germans. And also we are working on translating these leaflets to many different type of uh, the languages. Now, because your chapter is very, very um, uh, active, maybe you don't need to translate, but uh, if you want to translate, then you can contact us uh, so that you can work on the translation, okay? Now, uh, probably this is uh, good information for those who are in the academic, uh, academia. For example, we have uh, two important uh, IGS official journals, Geotextile and Geomembranes, and Geosynthetics International. By the way, if you are uh, the member of IGS, uh, you can have uh, freely, you can have access to these journals. And the important thing is that these are a very high impact factor. 
you know that what the what the impact factor means, right? Now, how important that is, you know that probably. So if you want to publish your work on the synthetics, uh, this is the one that you want to try. Oh, okay. This is also important uh, information. Upcoming IGS conferences. Well, because of the pandemic, we couldn't have uh, I, our uh, regional and uh, international conferences. Actually, international conference was scheduled next year, but we have we had to postpone. So, this is a new up to date. Okay, up to date information. Uh, we will have international conference, which is twelfth uh, ICG, will be held in Rome. Uh, 2023. Okay, so this is the date will be announced soon, but the day will be uh, similar to the uh, close to the original date. And uh, Asian regional conference, which is probably uh, most more interesting, will be held in next year, uh, the, uh, the first week of November. Okay, so this is a new date actually. So it has been postponed to. Uh, November uh, from the April. And we will have European conference next year, uh, September in Warsaw, and African regional conference in Cairo, Egypt in 2023, and Pan American conference will be held in 2026 in Canada. Okay. So because of the pandemic, you had to postpone, but uh, uh, I hope that we can have good, interesting, and uh, you know, uh, important this regional and international conference in person, hopefully. I, I hope so. Okay. Okay. Let's move on to uh, uh, next topic, which is global warming and sustainability. Now, before I talk about the global warming, let me just show you important uh, the, uh, the videos. Probably some of you have seen it, but a couple of years ago, we had a massive urban slope failure in Seoul. That has nothing to do with the rainforest Seoul wall, but I'm talking about the natural slope. Uh, actually, we have uh, monsoon season uh, running from June and July, okay? Uh, the uh, typical, uh, the, uh, the annual precipitation is about 13, hundred millimeters, but uh, for two days, uh, two days, as you can see in, in July sometime, we had a total of 700 millimeters of rain. That means about two thirds of annual precipitation came down for two days. That was a lot of rain. Unfortunately, we have, uh, we had a massive slow failure as you can see, okay? So this is a picture. And we had 19 people dead. Now, this is a map of Seoul. This is Gangnam area. You remember the Gangnam style? Okay, so this is a fun area, a business uh, district. And this is a, a mountain, only three kilometers away. So we are talking about the urban fairly. Okay. So these uh, are, are the scars of slow failure. You can see that we had multiple slow failure, debris flow type failure. And you can see the high rise apartment. This is eight rain, uh, uh, the roadways. And that is what happened. So we had, as I mentioned, multiple slow failures and here and there altogether, nine people uh, died, unfortunately. So this is a rainfall record. Uh, so we have this, uh, this about, uh, uh, if we talk about the slow failure, we have in that region, we have about 360 millimeters of rain for 36 days, uh, 36 hours, as you can see. So, so starting from the early, uh, late evening, going into the uh, early morning, and we had slow failure at 9 a.m., okay, July 24. 27. So this is the video. Uh, so this is a home video taken by a, uh, the resident uh, of the, uh, this high rise apartment building. So they were frightened. Let's take a look. 밤새 내린 비로 강처럼 변한 서울 남부 순환도로 우면산 꼭대기에서부터 하얀 불보라를 일으키며 도로 위로 토사가 밀려듭니다. 도로를 덮친 토사는 
가로수를 쓰러뜨린 뒤 곧장 아파트 단지로 달려듭니다. 아나가비리. 다른 동에서 지켜본 우면산입니다. 정상에서 시작된 산사태가 마치 폭포처럼 산케슬을 타고 도로로 쏟아집니다. 어마어마한 조사에 지켜보던 가족들도 혼비백산합니다. 어제 오전 8시 5분 여학수 씨는 평소처럼 딸을 차에 태워 집을 나섰습니다. 약 15분 뒤 왼편 우면산 쪽에서 엄청난 양의 토사와 물이 쏟아집니다. 바로 앞에 있던 차량들이 순식간에 사라졌습니다. 일촉즉발의 순간 여 씨는 급히 제동장치를 밟았고 토사가 유리창에 튀었지만 차량이 휩쓸려가는 것은 간신히 피할 수 있었습니다. Okay, now this is after, uh, you know, uh, after the slow failure. You can see that uh, This is high-rise apartment and quite expensive one. They lost the electricity for two weeks. So they suffered a lot of uh, problems. So this is a, a picture taken from a eight-lane uh, eight roadways, very heavy. And this is a Samsung, you can see the logo. So, you know, the amazing thing is that the slope was very gentle, as you can see. maybe 20 degrees and so on. And uh, we had, uh, uh, we investigated the cause of the failure, uh, but the main, uh, definitely rainfall was uh, the main triggering factor, but uh, we had uh, the small reservoir on top. So because of the you know, rain, uh, reservoir was broken. So we had uh, that kind of massive debris types, uh, debris flow type failure. So global warming is not the, you know, uh, the issue uh, for others. It is right next door, okay? So uh, the human activities uh, after, uh, during the, 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 uh, the, the industrial uh, the, uh, the era, uh, human activities caused the temperatures to rise 1.2 degree, degree Celsius, right? Now it is expected that we're going to have another 1.5 degree Celsius increase between 2030 and 2052 if we uh, don't do anything. So 1.5 degree Celsius doesn't seem like much, but it is a lot. Uh, it, it has a lot of impact. So and the effect of global warming is mean temperature increase in land and ocean. and heavy precipitation and probability of a drought, okay? So this is Korean, uh, uh, the statistics from Korea. As you can see here, we had about also uh, close to one degree Celsius increase in temperatures and also significant increase in precipitation. So nowadays, uh, Korean, uh, I live in Seoul and, and uh, our the, the, the weather has become like uh, subtropical uh, uh, weather. a lot of rain and during uh, summer the temperature goes up to 39 or 38 degrees celsius a lot of rain and humid you know so that uh, we uh, blame that kind of trend uh, for uh, global warming so sustainability has become a keyword right so uh, the current model of development is not sustainable so we have you need change right So we have to reshape the goal for uh, society uh, development co considering uh, climate change and energy and natural resource protection and sustainable communities and so on, okay? So we have to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions, the GHG, that's what it's called. Now, we also, uh, as, uh, in, in the construction uh, sector, we have to do something, right? Uh, so uh, we need a sustainable solutions by adopting innovative materials and new design and construction technology uh, for construction. Now, this is the, uh, the fact that I uh, got from the internet. 
The buildings and construction together account for 36% of global final uh, the energy use and 39% of energy related carbon dioxide emissions. Wow, that's a lot, right? So construction uh, sector must do something. So civil engine projects also produce uh, greenhouse gas, right? So uh, we have to estimate a greenhouse gas for a particular project and you have to try to reduce the greenhouse gas uh, by adopting uh, innovative materials and uh, new construction and, and design approaches, okay? And uh, the UK government and BSI, British Standard, uh, they developed a, a way of calculating uh, carbon footprint, which is in the greenhouse gas emissions uh, for the civil engine projects. So I think that be will become a standard. In Korea, we don't really uh, consider that, but in the near future, I think that is a very big factor in evaluating and, and, and awarding and any project, I think. So carbon footprint, as you can see, and not only carbon dioxide and methane and nitrous oxidate, and many different type of uh, uh, the, uh, the gases are considered for a carbon footprint. And uh, uh, we have to consider those in a civil engine pro the project, considering the person, elect, organization, and equipment, products, and so on. So, uh, the, uh, for the global warming potential, we have to consider that and we have to calculate. I'm not going, to, I cannot uh, go over here uh, detail for the, how to calculate global warming potential, but uh, we have to consider the material used in a project and crews and equipment. And then we can calculate the expected global warming potential. And this will, I think be a very important factor uh, for a particular project in uh, later on, I guess. So geosynthetic, why? Just because I'm talking about geosynthetics as a sustainable solution, you know, then there, there are many different type of geosynthetics, right? Uh, Geogrid, geotextile, GCL, and geospacers, and so on. And also they have many different type functions. Now, why I'm talking about geosynthetics as a sustainable solution? Because they allow us to reduce the use of natural resources, as I will talk about later. So they have become a regular engineering material, civil engineering material in roadway construction, bridge construction, a railway, wall and slopes and coastal protection, landfill, canal, dam, tunnel, and mining. We can, geosynthetics are being used everywhere. They are, be, now, now actually geosynthetics are not anymore new material. They are regular civil engineering material. So this is a cartoon that uh, illustrating that geosynthetics are used uh, in uh, a civil engine project. Now, I like this cartoon, okay? Geosynthetics uh, provides a sustainable solution because it allows us to have smaller construction footprint, which means less land uh, disturbance. And also uh, geosynthetics are uh, significantly lighter then earthen materials, right? You can see that this one, right? So one truck of GCL, geosynthetic clay liner, is equivalent to 150 trucks of clay. See, that means you can save money and also it allow us to reduce carbon footprint. And also another good thing is that uh, by use uh, of uh, geosynthetics, we can reuse on-site materials, okay? So that's why I'm saying geosynthetics are a sustainable solution. So you know that a geosynthetic rainforest soil wall can replace a conventional retaining wall, right? And uh, for uh, landfill construction, we need uh, drainage aggregate this thick, but if we use a geocomposite, we can reduce uh, the amount of drainage aggregate, right? So to produce uh, aggregate, it produces also uh, carbon dioxide. So by adopting just uh, geosynthetics, we can reduce the uh, global, uh, the, uh, the gas emission, okay? And also same thing, 
You know that in landfill, we use uh, uh, the clay, compacted clay liner was used, but nowadays we this uh, the synthetic clay liner has replaced uh, compacted clay liner. You can see that by a layer of just synthetic clay liner, we can use this thick uh, compacted clay liner. Okay. So we can use, we can reduce uh, the uh, natural resources by adopting geosynthetics uh, quite a lot. That is very important message that we have to send out to the general public. Owners, that is, that is your responsibility uh, to uh, send, to disseminate this information uh, to the owners. Okay, let's, let's talk about the, uh, the technical uh, the, uh, the, uh, principles that we have to use for uh, synthetic rainforest soil wall. You know that okay, I'm not going to talk about the, what the synthetic rainforest soil walls is, but it is very safe, economic, and also uh, it has high resistance to earth loading. Okay, so it has already proven in many different areas. So you can uh, construct a beautiful, a beautifully looking uh, walls. Uh, so in Korea, actually, it is not that difficult to uh, see uh, 50 meter high, 20 meter high geosynthetic or you know mechanized stabilized earth walls. Okay. So it has become a uh, the uh, has proven to be uh, sound and and robust uh, retaining wall systems. Now, as you know, uh, there are uh, several components uh, within just synthetic uh, rainforest soil walls, right? So backfill, and also uh, reinforcement, drainage aggregate, and draining. So each component has its role. So when we design and construct these walls, we have to consider the roles of each component based on the technical principles, right? So we have to use uh, the free draining material, right? But sometimes it is inevitable to use uh, you know, soil with fine grain, uh, the materials. If that's the case, we have to provide additional measures to prevent uh, the bad thing to happen, right? Now I'm going to discuss uh, the wall failure. Now, uh, I'd like to make clear that this wall was designed badly, constructed badly, badly, and also uh, mother nature, rainfall played a uh, role. So three factors came together and brought the wall to failure, okay? That has nothing to do with the rainforest earth wall concept, okay? Even though you have a medicine, if you, you know, uh, uh, the, use the medicine in different way, then that is actually uh, not a you know, medicine anymore, right? Same thing. So again, uh, in July, because that now this is different year, okay? I think this is five or six years ago. But July, it collapsed in July after the, the, the monsoon season, okay? So the height of the wall was 7.4 meters. And the total length is almost 70 meters. It, so quite the massive failure we had. The wall was completed in May, no problem, immediately after the construction, but collapsed in July after the rainfall, monsoon season. Again, contrary factors were design, construction, and the rainfall. See? So the collapse portion extended approximately to 60 meters. The total slit volume of soil exceeded 1,200 cubic meters. So this was the one of the largest wall failure in Korea. Okay. So you can see the pictures. By the way, this site uh, uh, was uh, uh, near the mountains. They cut the slope and they, uh, they uh, created a factory and the, uh, the, 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 the zone. Uh, and so the rainforest soil wall was uh, uh, constructed uh, as part of that project, okay? You can see that the road surface, okay? 
So uh, before me, I go on, uh, there are a couple of things to uh, consider. First, again, uh, even though the war was com completed in May and failure occurred in July, that means immediately after the construction, no problem, those wall was intact, okay? But during the rainfall, the, the monsoon season, June and July, we had 800 millimeters of rain, okay? In July alone, we had 100, uh, 580 millimeters of rain, okay, with a maximum rate of 155 millimeters per day. So that is significant amount of rain. Now, this is again, we have four components. Now, each one has its own role. Some people can say, okay, this is a uh, geosynthetic reinforced wall. Geosynthetic is the important one. Nothing else can be treated, you know, uh, without any caution. That's wrong. Each component has to be dealt with, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the, the consideration, okay? So I was uh, involved in, uh, as a kind of forensic study to answer the following question. What went wrong? Okay, why the wall uh, failed? And whose fault was it? Who's to blame? Designer, uh, and contractor, or else? I had to give an answer. And also another important uh, question was, why not uh, failure didn't occur during rainfall? Okay. So to answer those questions, uh, myself and our team conducted a field investigation and testing and limited clear based stability analysis and also uh, stress and polar press coupled uh, finite element analysis to answer those questions. The first thing we did was to go out to the site and reconstitute the, 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 the sections of uh, the completed wall. You know, in Korea, if something happens, try, people try to hide. So it was very difficult to get a design drawing. Nobody wanted to give. So we actually measure and and uh, and 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 ask for the information and had uh, this kind of section. As you can see, now this portion was actually uh, they cut the slope. The they cut the mountain and. And this is a compacted soil zone, embankment zone, okay? And this is a, uh, the geosynthetic rainforest soil. Now, what I was found, how I was amazed was that the length is only the 70% of the height of the wall. That is okay, right? When you have flat surface, but you have backs, you know, uh, the slope right here, right? So I, I, we can immediately say, oh, design was wrong, okay? The designer did not take the backslope account, right? So if designer considered that, the reinforcement length should have made longer, right? That was first uh, immediate uh, the assessment, okay? And also we did some uh, laboratory tests on the backfield soil. You can see that percent passing number 20 sieve, that is fine, 37%, okay? So you should not have, they should not have used this soil as backfill, right? That is a really, really bad soil, right? That means if the water goes in, it takes a lot of time to water, for water to get out, right? So the soil was classified as uh, the, the clay sand, Okay, as you can see here. And hydraulic conductivity, uh, the as compacted uh, uh, state was 1.1 times 10 to minus six centimeters per sec. Okay. And these are the, uh, the uh, just the technical properties, shear strength properties. Now, because it contains a lot of fines, if you do the, uh, you know, uh, effective stress analysis test or shear strength analysis or direct shear test or you know uh, CD test or CU test, you will have 
cohesion. Now, still we are doing it. In practice, I, I insisted that we should not use cohesion for design, but people tend to use this. This value can, uh, can be gone you know, with, uh, with, with, with rainfall, right? So anyway, the soil was bad, okay? And design was bad. There was two factors and the contractor should have used the better soil. So that's why I'm saying construction was not good. See, if these geotechnical properties were used without, without uh, uh, cohesion, this is the, the stability uh, calculation, see? Uh, for the, the bottom, bottommost layer, you can see that the, uh, the internal stability factor of safety are lower than uh, the required. Okay, so this is tensile overstress and this is pull out. So we can see that much smaller than one. And also base, slide, base sliding also very small, okay. And also I, I will talk about later, but the overall uh, slope stability factor of safety was also very small. So if the designer considered uh, the geotechnical parameters and geometry uh, correct, and he or she, she uh, should have noticed that design was not good but he or she did not consider that. That was the problem. And also to answer those questions, we did uh, the uh, slope stability analysis, but considering the infiltration, you can see that uh, we considered the uh, metric suction as well, okay? So nowadays you know that the uh, software is available. You do the uh, infiltration analysis and take the result to the slope stability analysis to find out the uh, time variation of factor of safety. Right? So we uh, did the test uh, to get the soil water characteristics, retention characteristics, and also uh, permeability characteristics. So these are the, uh, the required input for the infiltration analysis. You can see that. So this is a model. And uh, the, uh, the, these are the results for the suction. Uh, and uh, I would say a uh, port of pressure distribution uh, during and after the, uh, the rainfall. Now in this analysis, we consider the suction, a metric suction, which is very important for uh, the uh, geotechnical structure stability, right? The st when the, the, the soil is, uh, it remains unsaturated, you know that the soil has suction, right? So we consider that suction during the analysis. You can see that because of the rain, the suction uh, decreases eventually almost zero. Okay? So the reason why the wall was stable immediately after the, uh, the construction is because of suction, you know. Suction provided uh, uh, the the additional uh, the strength component, uh, so that it allows uh, the wall uh, to stay intact. Okay, but suction can decrease with the um, uh, rainfall, the infiltration. So this is what uh, happened. Okay. So you can see this is the uh, the suction uh, uh, the and consider suction uh, the you know, shear strength as you can this is a part of the suction right so so conventional uh, uh, shear strength uh, the theory we all, we do not consider this but so the conventional uh, the uh, shear strength uh, we can say that this is conservative right. But you know, even though we are considering the conservativeness, uh, still we have failures. That means we are doing, uh, we, we are not practicing uh, correctly. Okay, so this is the uh, change in metric suction with time. So this is uh, initial, and you can see the decrease in metric suction within the rainfall soil uh, with time because of the uh, rainfall, okay? So this is a result of global stability analysis. 
So uh, the, the, because of suction, uh, the, the, the actual factor of safety was 1.2, uh, above 1.2. That's why the wall stayed stable immediately after the, con the construction. But because of the rainfall, the suction decreases, uh, so did the factor of safety, as you can see. So when we had uh, the failure, the, the factor of safety eventually decreased it below 1.0. So this actually tells us why uh, the wall failed. And also we did, uh, as I mentioned, a stress portal press coupled analysis to see the uh, time variation of the stress and portal press development. So you can see also it, sh it shows that uh, the wall displacement, uh, the, the abruptly increased due to the loss of metric suction, as you can see. So wall failed right here. So this is immediately after the, uh, the, the wall construction and uh, during the rainfall and during the, the uh, uh, immediately after the rain, the, the failure, you can see the plastic strain development. So uh, the stress portal pressure analysis, uh, the successfully captured uh, what uh, the happened during uh, and, and after the rainfall. So this is also uh, rainfall, uh, rainforce, uh, reinforcement load increase profile, and also maximum reinforcement, uh, the, the, the evolution over the maximum reinforcement load. Okay, so actually, uh, uh, I must say that the, I actually, I gave you two sets of results, the limited clear and varied result and also finite element. Uh, I did not calibrate the model. The calibration means we uh, change the parameters and model to match the field observation uh, and the result. But I did not do that. But I don't know. The, the results uh, were really in agreement with the field observation. That means if you uh, do the properly, uh, your analysis, you can match, you can explain uh, what's happening or what happened in the field with your model. So that is another thing. So here, the, uh, the wall failure conclusion of the forensic study was improper wall design. It did not meet the design requirement and the factor of safety for global stability was less than one. And also that, I, this is a critical thing. The geotechnical modeling was wrong. That is the important thing, okay? The modeling is, was well, severely wrong. That, that is, I think, uh, uh, something we have to keep in mind that. Now you have uh, softwares, testing equipment, okay? They will tell, they will give the number, but you have to estimate whether those numbers are correct. You have to evaluate your geotechnical model, geometrical model, whether that makes sense or not. Otherwise, the result may be garbage. Garbage in, garbage out. That's something that I really like, okay? And also quality of backfill was bad, okay? Percent of fines, 37%. If possible, you should avoid uh, using uh, that kind of material. If you have to use it, you have to provide uh, the measures, maybe, uh, that answer uh, can be uh, seen later on slides. And also rainfall because of the global warming. Okay, so this, we cannot really do that, but that is, was also the fact. But the geotechnical principle that we learned from here is that geotechnical, the important thing is uh, uh, geotechnical 101, right? Geotechnical engineering 101. That is very important, okay? And also, this is also geotechnical engineering 101. You should use uh, free draining material. If you cannot, you have to provide a measure. How? Well, maybe you already know, but in case where you have, um, you have to use, uh, you know, uh, backfill soil with uh, significant fines, maybe 20%, 25%. 
you have to provide a way measures to drain uh, the uh, portal pressure during the rainfall. Okay. So nowadays uh, we have talked about internal drainage, as you can see, internal drainage by providing uh, just textiles or specially uh, devised uh, the layers of internal drainage can work uh, for that purpose. So uh, the, I have been working on uh, to develop a hybrid, so-called hybrid, uh, uh, the geosynthetics combined, which combines geogrid and uh, uh, geotextiles so that it also, it provides not only reinforcement uh, function, but also a drainage function as well. So actually I've been working quite a lot, uh, quite a while and and the and and we I had to uh, verify not only uh, uh, the numerically but also uh, the uh, physically. So we conducted uh, a lot of tests. Actually, you know, if you are students, you know how hard it is to uh, do the test with water. When it comes to water, it's, that is heavy. My my students uh, worked a lot on this project. Uh, probably. Uh, five or 10, they really uh, did a lot of work and I really appreciate those students. Anyway, to find out uh, the, uh, the, the effect of internal drainage, we did a lot of tests on uh, using uh, the small scale model. So we placed uh, reinforcement as well as uh, the internal uh, drainage layer here and there. And we put the uh, the, vol the volumetric uh, water content measurement, which is uh, tensiometers, as you can see, albedities, and also we uh, devised rainfall simulator so that we can control the amount of and, and rate of reinforcement over time. And these are the, uh, because of the, this small scale, we had to meet the uh, similitude law, right? So we have to scale everything down. And uh, uh, we use the textile, uh, and this is the uh, uh, the widest uh, the uh, the tensile uh, test result as you can see, and the the, uh, the dark uh, the black dot is uh, the uh, the geotextiles uh, with waterproofing to simulate. Uh, the reinforcement without internal drainage and white dot includes uh, it simulates the, the geosynthetics with internal drainage. So this is test procedure. Uh, it uh, looks very easy, but it, when it comes to use the water, it's headache really. So this is a picture and uh, we uh, also use the uh, digital image correlation to, uh, to investigate uh, the uh, ground movement during the rainfall. So this is a result I'm just uh, the, uh, show, uh, showing you just quick, uh, the small part. And we also measured the amount of water uh, came out of this, uh, the, uh, the uh, backfield soil. So this is instantaneous an amount of water volume, and this is cumulative. As you can see, uh, the, the, the reinforcement with internal drainage showed uh, more uh, water volume discharge, as you can see, both instantaneous and, and uh, cumulative. And at one point, you can see that uh, volumetric water content is smaller for uh, the uh, in, with the internet uh, the internal drainage, and then without internal drainage, you can see that. And also, wall displacement is smaller uh, when you provide internal drainage than without internal drainage. You can see the wall profile as well. And also, with different rainfall intensity, you can see that the effect of internal uh, drainage is significant. And this is the, uh, the, uh, the digital image correlation result, as you can see. This is without and with internal drainage. You can see that uh, the wall uh, displacement, uh, ground deformation uh, significantly reduced by the internal drainage uh, effect. 
Now, a uh, question is, now we, I wanted to go further. Okay. Innovative thinking. Okay. This has not been, uh, you know, uh, uh, the uh, practically implemented, and, but uh, probably uh, we will be able to find a way to do that. Now we provided internal drainage. What about if we add temperature, uh, what's going to happen? So maybe we can uh, supply thermal energy to accelerate the drainage. Okay. Now this is possible. Now this is actually, this idea came from McCartney from uh, the US uh, San Diego. He, he, st he studied a lot about the geothermal uh, the, the, uh, structures. So I just borrow the concept. Now, you know that uh, the thermal coefficient of soil and water are different. The soil's water coefficient of thermal expansion is much larger than water, as you can see. So if we supply the water, the, the temperature, the thermal energy, then we'll have differences in volume expansion in soil particles and also water, okay? See? So what happens is that if you have different uh, the volume expansion in soil particles and water, because soil particle has a larger volume expansion, thermal expansion, you will have increased vol uh, pore pressure within soil. Which means if you provide some uh, drainage layer, the thermal energy increased elevated temperature will uh, be accelerate at the drainage. Okay. So this, is, this was a concept. So I, I, I had to see whether that works or not, okay? So we did some tests. So we provided, this is a thermal exchange, exchanger. So we provided some uh, hot water through the silicon, uh, the tubes within the backfill, okay? Several layers. And this is the result. This is the white dot is with temperature, black without temperature because of the accelerate, accelerated drainage, the wall becomes more stable. You can see that, okay? So this is also the, uh, the uh, digital correlation image. Without internage, without doing nothing, internal drainage and with temp accelerated temperature. You can see that if we combine internal drainage with temperature, you see that we can reduce the wall displacement, we can promote, we can increase the wall safety tremendously. The question is probably, I still have a question, probably you do the same thing. How, how we can supply heat? That is a question. Maybe solar energy, that is, we, you can find the uh, solar panel everywhere, right? Or we can talk about self-heating synthetics anything you can you can I think about it as a heat supply uh, uh, source okay then question is if we apply heat what about the source the reinforcement interaction okay so we did some study on the effect of a temperature on the interface uh, behavior between soil and reinforcement okay so this is preliminary, but you can see that if we apply, if we, if we supply heat, even the shear, shear resistance characteristics increases, okay? It's a positive impact rather than negative. No degradation of soil reinforcement interaction. Now this is temporary, this is intermediate, uh, this we haven't concluded yet, but this uh, gives some kind of premises uh, that this may work, okay? So now our laboratory, we are doing a lot of research on this, okay? So concluding remarks, well, global warming is a very important topic that we cannot ignore, okay? And because of global warming, we may have severe rainfall, okay? But 
in order to uh, keep our geosynthetic structure safe, we have to practice the uh, uh, technical principles, okay? About the soil behavior and drainage and also geotechnical uh, modeling as well, okay? And geosynthetics have become sustainable solutions in various projects. So as the member of IGS, you should be a, a messenger for this particular uh, message. Geosynthetics are sustainable solutions. With that, thank you for your attention. Well, Chung Sik, thank you very much for that uh, very interesting presentation with with the uh, some of those early messages from what can happen when we have these extreme uh, climatic events going on uh, through mm -hmm. to some some fundamental research uh, looking at reinforced soil and uh, it's interesting you made that comment about how people kind of like to hide things when we have failures, which of course is a big shame because. We learn a great deal from examining right. failures mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. basically what we do and what other civil engineers will do will be far, far better if, if we can learn from failures uh, rather than people trying to um, avoid publicizing them. It, it, it seems mm -hmm. like it's a weakness, but actually it's a strength because everybody exactly. gains yeah. from it. But um, mm -hmm. thank you very much. I mean, that, 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 that was some, some very, very uh, interesting information and we we have a few questions here, which I, I've had a look at, and I think we'll mm -hmm. we'll take them in order. So far, there are, there are three of them, but uh, there could be more. So the first mm -hmm. one actually is from my colleague, Maheza in, in Kuala Lumpur. And he says, thank you for a brilliant presentation. It is clear that the, uh, the geosynthetic reinforced soil wall failure was triggered by the heavy rainfall, which was exacerbated by poor design and construction. So firstly, first question, mm -hmm. would the structure have failed eventually if extreme rainfall events didn't occur? And then additionally, if we think globally, is it possible that there may be structures like that that are ticking time bombs and would fail if the conditions were just right? So, <laughs> <laughs> well, there you are some interesting ones okay. there for you. <laughs> okay, uh, my question is, if uh, we didn't have rainfall, I think, and the wall uh, would have still you know, remained intact, okay? Because of, I talked about the metric suction, right? So metric suction, we don't consider metric suction during our design, but the metric suction is there as long as uh, the backfill soil remained unsaturated. Uh, so that is a redundancy, okay? Redundancy. And also current design, uh, the, the principles and design guidelines are conservative, so. So my, my answer to that question is that the wall would not, uh, would stay, uh, remain intact, stable, if had we didn't, we had the, the no uh, rainfall uh, happen. That is my question. And if we practice, uh, you know, uh, the geosynthetic structure design and construction as uh, intended, I mean, according to the design and uh, construction guideline, geosynthetic structures are, you know, very, very stable. So you don't have to worry about that, okay? So the, the, the example that I showed is had a bad design, bad construction, okay? Which we should avoid, okay? But if you do correctly, geosynthetic structures are very, very stable and resilient and good, uh, you know, you know the, the, the structures that we can, uh, the, the guarantee the sta stability over time. Mm, I hope that can be a, that can be uh, your uh, the, my, uh, the, uh, the answer. Hopefully, mm. I think personally there probably are some time bombs around. But <laughs> 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 yeah. Okay. So now from uh, Ahmed, this is um, a very detailed question about about types of strain gauge. So he says, any instrumentation suggestion for monitoring geosynthetic strain and elongation besides cyanoacrylate based strain gauges. I think those are the ones we stick on uh, considering high strain and elongation will occur. So any other ideas mm -hmm. about strain measurements? Well, uh, 
I, I can only uh, uh, give you very uh, shallow, you know, my uh, the background. Uh, strength, uh, you're still using uh, in my laboratory strain gauge, but that is very difficult, you know, and you know that probably, you know, it's, it, it has very low survivability and sometimes we, we uh, cannot guarantee the, uh, mm, the, the result. But if we use properly, that gives an answer. But I think what, uh, we can use, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the potentiometer uh, and, and during the test. And then that, okay, that can al allow us to calculate a global strain rather than, you know, uh, the local strain. I think that is the one thing that we can do. Also, we can probably use fiber optic uh, you know, sensors to measure the st strain gauges. I think that, that there are several uh, research going on, uh, especially uh, the measurements of reinforcement. Okay. Yeah. yeah, no, I think I think it's, it's, I think mm -hmm. it's just quite an interesting discussion point that. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, one observation I'd have to say to anybody, just to add a, a comment, is that when you're designing instrumentation systems, you want to have some redundancy because uh, right. sometimes relying on a single measurement might mislead you, which I've, I've had experience of that happening. Uh, so for example, for a simple forward deformation of a structure is, mm -hmm. a, is a very simple measurement and can be very helpful if you're also incorporating mm -hmm. strain gauges on reinforcement. Um, so yes, that, that's, there's a, a whole big discussion in that, in that particular question. So, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I'll move on. The next question is coming from... Uh, uh, before, oh. before, before we go on, just one, one thing that I'm trying now in our laboratory is that if you are running a uh, research, for example, rather than uh, the measuring strain in the field, uh, if you provide a, uh, a transparent uh, the plexiglass glass on your backfield with the reinforcement, you can use uh, digital uh, correlation analysis uh, technique to measure the strain uh, within the view of the uh, the uh, the uh, transparent uh, the plexiglasses. Uh, that is uh, just we measure the uh, the 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 plane uh, the uh, the strain using that uh, digital correlation technique. But that is another thing. But there have been many uh, the attempts to use that uh, technology. But I think that has some kind of uh, future uh, in the near future. Yes, I think obviously yeah. for, for labor, laboratory investigation. Laboratory investigation yeah, rather than yeah. field. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, next question from uh, Pat Gochi Leong. He, he was our previous, the, the previous uh, president of our own uh, local chapter here. So um, he says it's a good presentation and experiment. Um, and he said, I, I think PVD can be placed horizontally to, to provide horizontal drainage at a certain distance, say every 1.5 meters. Then the horizontally placed PVD is connected to the vertical drainage layer behind the facing. What do you think of that, Professor Jungsik? I 100% agree with that approach. Actually, there have been many attempts using uh, to use the PVD as the in internal drainage layer within the reinforced soil wall. That has been very successful. I think you're connecting horizontal layers and vertical. You can provide, a, we can create a drainage system, uh, which I think will work uh, perfectly uh, for the, uh, the heavy rainfall uh, event uh, to increase the stability of all. I think that is quite uh, uh, the proper way of handling uh, the PVD and, and also the rainfall. I think that is a good approach, I guess so. Yeah, I guess one thing I'd have to note there is that um, you, you might want to look at the creep of those materials in the long mm -hmm. term because, mm -hmm. because flow rates could really could reduce mm -hmm. uh, due to the effect of creep of the core. But anyhow, that's a detail. Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, now we have one from Ganeshwar and Pillai. Good afternoon, Professor Chung Sik. Um, mm -hmm. How effective are grass and trees in preventing slope failure during heavy rainfall? That's a good question. Uh, I think we have posit positive as well as negative effect. Uh, the, the trees and grass, uh, the uh, initially will help, but if we have too much rainfall, you know, that that could be a uh, uh, some sort of driver for the failure as well. So I think Professor Datsuka have uh, presented many cases where 
uh, the, uh, the 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 wall failure occurred uh, because of the uh, you know uh, trees and so on. But anyway, I would say I cannot say that for sure. But uh, we we have to also consider positive and negative effect. If we have too much rainfall, that can be a problem. But initially, uh, grass and uh, trees will help uh, to maintain stability. Yeah, I think I think um, yes, the, 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 their effect can surely only be positive. But um, mm -hmm. yeah. okay, so now we have another question from Stanislav uh, Lenart, which actually is a question I'd written down to ask you myself. So, um, mm -hmm. increase of temperature might negatively affect the long-term mechanical behavior of polymeric 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 materials. Uh, have mm -hmm. you considered this? Obviously, this is talking about um, durability and so on. <laughs> Oh, definitely. That is a big factor that we have to consider. Definitely, uh, we have to make an assumption that uh, we use uh, polymeric material, uh, which we don't have to worry about the temperature effect. But that is another important research area. If we were to adopt that you know, elevated temperature approach, uh, you know, uh, to have that approach, you know, uh, as a, uh, a meaningful uh, way of handling rainfall. So I definitely agree. Uh, we haven't looked at it yet, but uh, I'm trying to uh, work with the uh, uh, material specialists, manufacturers, to uh, look into that effects. Uh, how how what, what is the what is the negative effect, the long term effect, and so on in terms of durability. That is very important. But that is a very important factor that we have to consider. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. I think the the next question actually from another of my colleagues, Joe Lau. Um, uh, it's, it's similar, but I'll, I'll, just in case there's some slight different approach to this, how, how significant the thermal energy will affect the soil temperature as it may affect the long-term performance of the geosynthetic material? That's a sort of an associated question. I'm not mm -hmm. sure you want to add anything to that one, Chung Sik, or not? Yeah, uh, the, 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 in terms of the geosynthetic, I, we, we already discussed. In terms of the soil, that's why uh, we, we study the effect of temperature on the soil and reinforcement interactions. So uh, we did uh, the direct shield test and the, the many other uh, different pullout tests as well. And I cannot say we uh, went too far that we can say we did study the long-term effect, but uh, based on the current results, uh, we can say that the, 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 the negative effect of temperature on the soil uh, reinforcement interaction is limited. But we, again, we have to look into the long-term effect. That is a very important topic as well. Okay, no, thank you very much. Okay, another question now from uh, Paul Garnica. It seems to me that if only the soil in the backfill had been adequate, I think this is talking about the failure, I, uh, gran granular with, with very few fines, the behavior of the wall would have been much better. Uh, and perhaps the failure would not have occurred. Um, the, what the failure demonstrates is that marginal soils should not be used in such walls. Well, that's an interesting discussion, but I'd like to have your comments on that first. Definitely. If we uh, had, had the granular soil, free draining material been used, probably uh, the wall would have uh, behaved much better. Uh, we haven't discussed, we haven't looked into whether failure would, would have occurred or not, but that is another topic. Well, speaking of marginal soils, uh, definitely we should not use it, but practically, sometimes it is not possible, you know, because of uh, in, 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 in remote region, it is difficult to transport good butcher to that side. It takes a lot of money. So people tend to use marginal soil. So in that case, if, if we cannot avoid using marginal soil, we have to provide additional measures, good drainage. We have to make sure good drainage, good cover so that the water cannot go in. So we have to take uh, additional measures to prevent that kind of failure uh, from occurring, okay? So uh, the, the topsoil, we have to make sure that uh, water cannot go in. We have to use different uh, the way and we have to provide good drainage and uh, I, th I think that's the very important thing. Uh, if you don't have rain, you know, so in, in Brazil and South America, they use a lot of marginal soil because they, the rain, they are limited in the amount of rain, but probably in your reason, you have a lot of rain, right? So if we can, we have to avoid it, I think. 
Yes, we certainly do. I'd have to, actually, I, I did make another comment to, to, to bring up with you here because, um, yeah, certainly in, in, in Indonesia, um, there is wide use of fine fills in reinforced soil structures, but um, mm. uh, we, we are lucky that some of our fills, principally the ones of volcanic origin, have remarkably good properties, even though they mm. are classified as clay, or we describe them as mm. clay. Um, mm. They, they do have very good properties and, and they are widely used in, in, in many of our, our, our highways and so forth. The, the, the structures are built using what we, we call tanamera, which simply means red soil. Mm. But um, of course, there are some soils around of alluvial origin, which you wouldn't want to use in these sorts of structures because almost certainly the behavior would not be very... Um, so I thought I'd just like to mention that because, because it is quite common in Indonesia to use uh, finer soils, but because they do have good properties and, and, and this by mm. now is, is well understood. Um, mm. So I, I, we just have an, one more, let me just, you know, ooh, a few more questions have crept in if I think we're okay for some time on this. Uh, any, any guideline or standard or technical material which can be used as reference for the infiltration analysis for uh, reinforced soil retaining walls? Hmm, well, um... Nowadays, uh, the uh, we have good softwares. I'm not going to name those softwares, <laughs> but but uh, the uh, quite popular softwares has very good the manuals and and theory uh, included in their the, the, the manual. So I think it is not too difficult to follow uh, the infiltration analysis procedure. But uh, if you can email me, I will I can provide you know, some of the papers so that you can refer to. So. Well, yeah. Well, thank you very much for that offer. That's that's, that's very, very kind. Um, the next mm -hmm. question from uh, Sepe uh, Chaladur. In the case of MSC Walls, I was wondering, do you recommend uh, a performance risk management by qualitative and semi-qualitative method before design and construction? This is quite a complicated question, but um, I hope you follow that. Well, the risk management, risk, assess risk assessment management is, you know, the very important part of any engineered structures. I think if you can, why not? You know, we can we can uh, uh, identify the risk, and we have we identify identify the uh, the way of avoiding those risks, and that is actually risk management. So if you can, uh, if you can do su such a risk analysis and management. Uh, in place, uh, why not? I think that is a good uh, practice as well, for especially uh, for the particularly uh, difficult project, the very complicated, complex, uh, the geometry and 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 the largest structures. I think uh, that is a good approach, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think you're right. Um, mm -hmm. Then we have a a, a question here from uh, Lukito Wijaya. Uh, in the case you use concrete pile wall instead of geosynthetic wall, is there any advantage in using a piled wall, a wall constructed using piles? Well, uh, if, if the foundation is not really good, let's say your foundation is not competent, maybe you want to use piled wall, but otherwise, uh, why not? Geosynthetic uh, reinforcement would have better uh, advantage, especially in Indonesia, you have, um, you know, many earthquake uh, events, right? Some in the, why not? Yep. Just very uh, reinforced all walls are flexible and very, uh, you know, has high resistance to earthquake eroding. I think uh, in that case, uh, just say walls is quite uh, more advantageous than the piled wall, unless you have, you know, uh, the bad foundation problems and so on. Yeah, no, I think I think that that makes good sense. And uh, mm. we a final question now from uh, Pat Gochi Leong again. Uh, this is a, he he asked a question about using the PVD just now. So he said another idea: Can we also adopt the theory of unsaturated soil mechanics, whereby at the very top layer we place lower permeability material, and below that a higher permeability material? I think that that, that what exactly that uh, the uh, uh, the background of your question is related to the uh, the topic uh, just before my talk. There was a capillary <laughs> capillary barrier, right? <laughs> yes, you're right. From from uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah yeah Professor Rahajo, yeah. 
<laughs> Raja, yeah, that is a capillary barrier. Definitely, capillary barrier is very important. Uh, the, we can provide some sort of uh, uh, impermeable uh, the, the barrier for uh, you know, for particular rain rainfall. So I think that is a good idea too. You know, so we have the the, the, the synthetic uh, can provide the capillary barrier, so we can adapt that theory and technique uh, for that particular case. I think that is good. So, you know, just said it can be used in, in many different ways. I think that is very, very, uh, you know, the innovative materials, I can say that. Yeah, no, I think, I think there is potential. I mean, if I could just give one bit of uh, a comment from my own personal experience is that when you look at materials in these structures of different permeabilities, Mm -hmm. uh, you've got to be very careful to make sure you don't create a dam of lower permeability that's blocking right uh, a higher permeability material so in other words water can enter a system quickly at the back but then it can't mm -hmm. get out quickly so so that means it tends to build up high pressure uh mm -hmm. i've seen this taking place in in projects in the middle east and and, and nothing failed luckily but but it was a, a, a very impressive experience um and it certainly brought to my mind immediately how, how it, you and these were these were all granular materials it's just that they had a range of permeability from a very open graded rock backfill to a well graded granular fill for the reinforced soil structure all all granular all beautiful materials very high quality but you had a, uh, this this variation of permeability, exactly, and mm -hmm. it, it ended up like being a dam, um, and mm -hmm. the the water level got very high. But luckily, the design was was very adequate, and nothing failed. But it was um, mm -hmm. extraordinary videos of water pouring out of the top of these structures as it made its mm -hmm. way over the top. Anyhow, um, I think that is bringing us to the end of the the Q and A. Mm -hmm. Shogun, thank you very much for answering all of these questions. I I, I think everyone, yes, we we've covered all of them. Uh, and I'd like to thank you also again for preparing uh, an extremely good talk. You've covered on some really important topics from the more general side of sustainability and uh, what's happening to our planet as if we're not careful about um, uh, the situation with, with global warming, which is definitely taking place and, and uh, we cannot deny that. And it's also nice to hear your opinion about how some of our geosynthetic solutions can can offer mm -hmm. a, quite a lot of help. And I, I thoroughly agree with you that it's something that we tend to look into these days. And there seem to be some major benefits in, in some, some of the geosynthetic based solutions for what you might call more traditional um, construction mm -hmm. procedures in the past. And um, uh, I, I, I think it's very nice if people can um, promote those and, and, and get more understanding about the, uh, the background, because every, every small contribution to this problem Will help, and it's not. It's Definitely. not going to be one big answer to solve global mm -hmm. warming. It'll mm -hmm. be lots of people taking on board their own small solutions in their own own areas where they work, and, and putting the whole thing together. Uh, exactly. And mm -hmm. uh, that I think is a really important message. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think if I'm sure the organisers are, are listening in now, I, I think we bring this to an end. The uh, the presentation and the Q and A. Chungsik again, thank you so much for catching up with thank us you. eventually. I, I know you've had to come to to see us in a virtual way for this particular presentation, but hopefully maybe one day it'll be in an actual sure. way when we have an event at some stage in the fu future where we, actually, we can actually meet face to face and, and hold these discussions in, in, in a much more mm -hmm. sociable manner. But um, however, these systems have allowed us to carry on and do Definitely. these sorts of events, which is wonderful. Mm -hmm. And again, mm -hmm. to the organizations, organizers of, of, of these events from the Indonesian chapter of IGS, thank you very much. And Chung Sik, again, uh, you, you can now relax. If you'd like to listen to the, uh, mm -hmm. the quiz, you might be very interested. And of course, it's all <laughs> held in English as well. So okay. um, please stay on and do that. And uh, if you want to sneak in there with the answers with, with some false name, you can, of course, do that. But we might catch up okay. with you on that. <laughs> thank okay. you. Thank you very and, much. Thank you. OK, thank you. to the organizers, over to you. Okay, thank you, Pam Mike, once again. Thank you, Professor Chung Sik Yu, for your excellent presentation. And thank you also to Baba Michael Dobi for guiding the session. Next, I would like to invite all of you for the chance to get the very interesting prize by joining a very short game we have prepared. The first winner will get 150,000 rupiah, and the second winner will get 100,000 rupiah. To give you a disclaimer before we play, everyone can join this quiz, but for technical reasons, 
uh, only those who live inside Indonesia are eligible to get the prize. So you can now directly go to your browser on your phone or your PC and then type menti.com, M-E-N-T-I dot C-O-M, menti.com. And then you have to type the code number shown on your screen or also there in the chat box. The code is 8088-5973. The code is 8088-5973. Once again, please go to menti.com from your browser or your PC and then put the code 8088-5973. Then fill in your name and make sure it is the name that you submit in the registration to this webinar. So later, if you win, the committee will easily contact you for the prize. Remember, the prize is very interesting. The total of 250,000 rupiah for two winners who live inside Indonesia, and you will not want to miss this chance. For those uh, who wants to join this uh, quiz, the, the questions are prepared by Professor Chung Sik Yu. There are three questions, 45 uh, seconds for each question to answer. And then uh, we will accumulate all the points for three questions and we will have two winners with the total of 250,000 rupiah. The first winner will get 150,000 rupiah and the second winner will get 100,000 rupiah. So go to menti.com, put the code 8088-5973 and then fill in your name. Let's see, <clears throat> we will be waiting for more attendees to join. I will share to you my screen. Mm. Okay. <clears throat> We, we only have 36 people, uh, you still can join. I will give you 30 more seconds. Please go to menti.com on your browser, uh, on your PC or uh, on your uh, phone <clears throat> and then type menti.com. And then please uh, put the code shown on your screen and also there in, uh, in the chat box. We will be still waiting for, an, uh, for other Participants, <clears throat> there are three questions prepared by Professor Chung Sik Yu. Because it's lunch time, I think we can uh, use the money to buy lunch. 250,000 rupiah for the total price. Uh, and we will have two winners. Okay, I will start the countdown. 10, 9, 8, 7, six, five, four, three, two, one. We will start the game now. <clears throat> Questions one of three, answer fast to get more points. In a geosynthetic reinforced structure, the reinforcement provide added confinement by, first option, compression, second option, shear, or is it tension? In a geosynthetic reinforced structure, the reinforcement provide added confinement by compression, shear, or tension. You have 30 seconds to answer, but please answer fast to get more points. <clears throat> 15 more seconds. All right, five, four, three, two, one. Time's up, and the correct answer is tension. Let's see who leads the leaderboard for the first question. For the first question, the one who leads is Ariani as the fastest who answer. And then let's go to the second question. Question two of three. Answer fast to get more points. When calculating the long-term design strength of geosynthetic reinforcement, several factors are considered, except is it creep, installation damage, or plasticity? When calculating the long-term design strength of geosynthetic reinforcement, several factors are considered, except creep, installation damage, or plasticity. Answer 
answer fast to get more points. You still have around 10 seconds. <clears throat> five four three two one times up the correct answer is plasticity let's see for the second question okay for the second question who leads the leaderboard is sunari jusuf but the fastest one is joe Last question, brace yourself. Answer fast to get more points. When designing a reinforced structure, what type of, of shear strength test should be conducted? Is it train test? Is it untrained test? Or is it vein shear test? When designing a reinforced structure, what type of shear strength test should be conducted? Is it the first option, train test? Is it the second option, undrain test? Or the third option, vein shear test? You have 20 seconds more. Two winners who will get the total of 250,000 rupiah. Let's see, you have 10 more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one time's up. The correct answer is drain task, the first option. Let's see who will be two winners of this quiz. <clears throat> okay. DP with 2,809 points. And also Sunadi Jusuf uh, with 2,808 points. Uh, for the winners, you can send the uh, screenshot of your screen uh, as the proof that you are the winners to Sandy. Uh, we will give you the number uh, at the end of the event. Okay, congratulations for both uh, the winners. <clears throat> Next. We invite you to the upcoming webinar under the theme Sustainable Applications of Green Geosynthetics Engineering. We'll be speaking in this webinar is Professor Nelson Cho from National Central University, Taiwan. The webinar will be held on November 24, 2021 at 6.30 p.m. Jakarta time. You can register at the link bit.ly slash webinar in IGS 11. Once again, you can register at the link bit.ly slash webinar in IGS 11, or you can also see on the chat box. Ladies and gentlemen, we have now reached the end of the event. Before you leave this webinar, we would like to inform you that you can access your e-certificates and the soft copy material from the speaker by visiting the link bit.ly slash info in IGS 10. After filling the quick survey, you will be redirected to the e-certificates. Once again, thank you for your participation, and we hope we can see you at the next event. Finally, good afternoon and stay healthy, everyone. Thank you.